So we have an international panel, again, from all over the world, not just Asia Pacific. So can, today, we are going to talk about being an EV adopter, their Tesla ownership experience, and how the landscape is changing. First, let's get them to introduce themselves briefly in maybe 30 seconds. Justin, over to you first. 30 seconds, okay. Uh, hi. Hi everyone, my name is Justin Ang. Uh, you might know me from the radio, Class 95 FM. I host uh, the morning show called Muttons in the Morning with my partner Vernon. He's not here today because he's not an EV driver, just me. Um, I've been a Tesla owner since early last year. Uh, I was one of the early Model 3 adopters. So very happy to be here. Um, so proud of what Darren has achieved with everything today. So very nice. If you have any questions, uh, be glad to answer them in a while. Thank you. Um, my name is Art. Like Darren introduced me uh, before, I am the president of the Tesla owner of Thailand, and I have my Model 3 I buy on 2000, uh, 2021, and uh, I am so happy to be here today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Heather Yen from San Francisco. And I have a, a Mandarin-speaking Mandarin, uh, Tesla channel. It's called Meishi Thailand. Maybe some of you know, some of you don't know, but it's okay. So basically, I am a, a Model Y and Model S owner in California. But it's kind of through the channel. So we uh, I, we started we connect to with my hometown Taiwan. The people the people over there. So we, I also start, have some experience in Taiwan. And to, today I'm going to share some amazing uh, Tesla experience in Taiwan too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for inviting us. And oh, that's my husband, uh, Cameron. Shout out, <laughs> Cameron. Cameron, raise to the crowd. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, hi, I'm Walter. Uh, I'm an economist at the uh, Singapore University of Social Sciences. Uh, so thanks for having me here as well. Uh, I own a Tesla Model 3. So uh, this is a great event. Uh, thanks to Darren and the organizing team for, for putting it together. Thank you all of you for being here. Now, one common question we all get is, why did you get an EV so early? Especially in Southeast Asia, we are not like California. It is not easy to find. When they first got their, their, their EVs, there were not so many Tesla superchargers like what we have today. Some of them had it for years. So maybe we start with uh, Professor Walter first. What made you take the leap of faith to get an EV? Yeah. So, so for, I think for me, I think it was, uh, it was an issue of the timing being right. Uh, I, I'd known about Tesla, I think, for quite some time. I, of course, I'd seen uh, videos of the Roadster, the Model S, and so on. But honestly, these were all cars that were way beyond, I think, uh, my price bracket, right? Uh, even if they were directly imported to Singapore and they weren't uh, surcharged by, you know, third-party dealers and so on, these would not be cars that I want to spend that much money on. But when the Model 3 is introduced, that changed everything because this was a car that was actually targeted at the mass premium market. It was a competitor to other cars that I have owned before, like uh, BMW 3 Series, for example, and you know, cars which a lot of Singaporeans can actually afford, right, to some extent. Uh, so that's why I think when the Model 3 came out and when Tesla Singapore actually officially launched the Model 3 uh, with a pricing that was very competitive because they didn't have the usual huge markups that authorized dealers tend to have for other car brands, that's when I decided to basically uh, get an EV. Because I think before that point, uh, EVs in Singapore were not really either at the right price point or they didn't offer the right capability. But I think Tesla changed all of that. And after that, I think now you have a lot more choices in terms of EVs which actually hit the mass market and which have the right capabilities for ordinary consumers. Heather, how about you? So yes, first I got my Model Y in California, but I found out actually in Taiwan, it's not really easy to start it earlier because they just have the first charger the uh, first supercharger in two, uh, 2017. And at that time, it's really not many superchargers and you need to drive, it, you, it's not possible, you need to get, get it around. But in like, last year, it's getting better now because uh, they start delivering the, the bad, I mean, Model Y, and this year they have the refreshed Model S and X. So in last year, it's like 
uh, supercharged grow so fast. Right now they have like 86 superchargers, almost like 500 uh, su uh, superchargers. So it's like, it grows slowly, but it's like after six years, it's just, it become really good after. So it's not really e easy in the beginning, but I believe uh, Tesla not just uh, building the car, but they trying to do the infrastructure at the same time. So it's, it's, it should be pretty good. Yeah. That's amazing. And Art, you got your Model 3 before Tesla officially launched, before there were any superchargers. Yes. <laughs> Actually, I uh, have to go back on 2017. Um, I am very really interested in, in the car, modified car. I used to be the lasers and on that day, my friend sent me the, some article about the Tesla uh, that uh, can be the Nissan GTR, the stock car that can be the uh, like a supercar. So I really interesting. But as, as you asking me why you interesting in EV, but actually I for me I interesting in Tesla. Is Tesla is not just EV car. Tesla is just Tesla. They, change the world, they have the performance, they use the smart car. So after I read that article, I try to study more about the Tesla. What is the Tesla? How the Tesla go on? And I have uh, the, the aim that my next car has to be the Tesla. And on 2021, uh, I go to the Bangkok Motor Shows and they introduced the Tesla by the gray market. So I decided to, okay, I have to buy this car. So that, that is my uh, starter with the Tesla. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Justin, what's your story for everyone? Oh. <laughs> uh, so my, mine is a very simple story. I'm a, I'm a massive techie. I love all things tech. Five years ago, I went to the US. I rented somebody else's Tesla to, to, to drive for a few days. And it was just a the freaking coolest car I ever drove. The tech was unrivaled. The charging network was just unreal. You know, you've never seen anything like that before. So I told myself at that time, if and when Tesla officially comes to Singapore, I'm buying one. And at that time, we're talking about pre-2020 here, there was no guarantees Tesla would come to Singapore. There was even a, there was even a little dig Elon Musk made on, on Twitter at a time saying that, you know, that the government is blocking Tesla from coming to Singapore. Something along those lines. So a lot of us were like, I, uh, might never happen. But the day Tesla arrived in Singapore, I knew I was going to get one. I knew it. So within four months, I think, uh, I, I jumped in and bought the Model 3. Wow. Yes. It's that good. <laughs> I know some of you may have questions for them. If you have, keep them in mind. Later, we'll open up for some of your questions. Now, as Early adopters, you have paved the way for everyone else here. You've seen a lot more chargers, you've seen a lot more family members, people asking you questions. So for those people who are still a bit worried, okay, they want to buy a car this year, but they're not sure whether they should get an EV, or maybe I just settle for a hybrid car first. What advice do you have for them? Let's start with Justin. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, with what I do, um, a lot of people ask me questions all the time. And the number one question I get asked bar none, is how do you charge your car, right? Because I think the mentality amongst most Singaporeans is that you, if you buy an EV, you must charge your car every day because they have the thinking of it's a smartphone, it's like a phone. If you have to charge your phone every day, you must charge your car every day. And if, there, if, I, if I can't charge my car every day, I won't buy an EV. To which I just ask them, do you pump petrol every day? Same thing. Why, why do you think you need to put charge your car every day? You know? And, and when you tell them that, it becomes a, oh, you mean if I drive to work and home, the battery doesn't go to zero? No, it doesn't. Not even close. You know? So after speaking to them about it, then they're more like, okay, okay, maybe I will consider an EV. And I think this conversation needs to be had with thousands of people in Singapore before they understand what it's like to drive an EV? For me, I think uh, we have to educate the people about the EV car. They have uh, uh, wrong information in their head a lot. Like EV car, 
uh, the battery will die after eight years. That is uh, like uh, bothering uh, to block them to, to buy the EV. So we have to more educate them that battery will not die. In my team, uh, Thai team, Khun uh, Ton drive uh, his Model 3 more than 240 kilometer, and wow. the battery is still good. So this is we have to like uh, communicate to other people that actually EV is like uh, not not uh, replacement energy cars, but this is the future of the car, and the trend is going to move. So I think we have we all have to share the the, the right information to them a lot. Okay. Thank you. And Heather, what about you, especially in California, where I guess the adoption is very high already? Yeah. But I w I, maybe I can talk about Taiwan. So, they, uh, but uh, I would say for charging, it's like similar to everywhere. You can charge even just the plug on the wall, right? But it's the slow charging, maybe charging at home, charging in public, fast charging, super charging. You can ask all the Tesla owner here. <laughs> That's why we are here. We know more a little bit uh, about this, but actually it's not that difficult. It's just need, need to know like slow charging, fast charging adapters. Like in Taiwan, it's a little difficult because it's, they have three different standards. They have CCS1, CCS2, and also the next. So it's really complicated, but uh, Tesla owners are everywhere that you can ask them and actually it's not that difficult. And you can use the, uh, Plug share a, a, a better route planner to plan in the trip. So X around people. People are here, so you should be good. Thank you. Yeah, so, so I think I, I'll deal briefly with charging before I deal with some other issues that people often bring up. So I think first on charging, I think right now in Singapore, you have the opposite problem. You have the problem of there not being enough EVs for the charging network that is deployed rather than the opposite. So if you talk to any charge point operator, they will tell you they're struggling to make money. They're struggling to make money because they've got far more installs of charge points in Singapore than there are actually EVs. And so as an EV owner, I never find a serious problem finding charging in a moment because of this imbalance. Now, of course, in the near future, this might change. There might be some local issues of finding charging if, for example, the operators don't respond fast enough. But Basically, there is no serious difficulty of charging congestion in Singapore at the moment because of this. But let me now get to uh, two other issues that I think people often bring up when they're on the fence about EVs. Okay, so one issue is technology. So a lot of people raise concerns like, oh, you know, why should I buy an EV now? I heard that there is some innovation to batteries or to energy like hydrogen or whatever that's going to happen in the near future. So if I buy an EV today, am I just buying something that's going to be old technology in one or two years' time? So that's one concern, right? And I think the other concern uh, people often raise is cost and resale value. So they say, okay, you know, if I buy an EV now, isn't it going to cost me more than buying an ICE car? So why should I do it? Why am I burning money on this? So I think you have to look at these issues a bit more carefully, right? So I think first, if you look at the technology issue, it's true that EV technology is changing very rapidly today. But at the same time, I think we are right now at a sweet spot where a lot of the core technologies have actually matured. And this was not true 10 years ago. Let's be honest about this. 10 years ago, if you bought an EV design back then, like an early Nissan Leaf or Renault Zoe or something like that, you would be stuck today, unfortunately, with a vehicle that is really not fit for purpose, with inadequate range and a lot of design compromises. But if this is not true today for any modern mass market EV. All modern mass market EVs, whether the Tesla is from competitors, actually do the same thing as a regular ICE vehicle, but they do it better. And that's the key here, okay? Because EVs 10 years ago didn't do things better than an ICE, but today all modern EVs do it better than an ICE. So I think in terms of tech obsolescence, that is much less of a concern today than it was five or 10 years ago. Uh, the other issue to touch on briefly is cost. And I think when it comes to cost, you have to look at the total cost of ownership bearing in mind that EVs use less energy costs, uh, bearing in mind that a lot of the maintenance costs are greatly reduced, the only remaining worry really for an EV is what you do with the battery. 
right? But due to regulations, uh, all new consumer EVs sold in our market actually tend to have about an eight-year warranty or so on the battery train. So that is much less of a concern given that most Singaporeans actually don't keep their car for much longer than the 10-year uh, year initial COE period as well. So when you look at the total cost of ownership, it looks a lot better once you take out all of the maintenance and reduce operating costs that the EV tends to have. Thank you so much. Now, as we think about getting EVs, we also wonder in our different markets that we represent, uh, how, when will we actually start seeing more EVs sold than ICE cars? And I'm wondering, from what you see talking to your friends, to your families, when do you feel more than half of all cars sold will become EVs? Let's start with Professor Walter. When are we going to see a transition point of it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so when we look at other markets, you find that the transition tends to happen when the price of an EV becomes about comparable with a similar ICE vehicle. So, for example, if you look at the Norway market, right? Uh, in Norway today, the majority of new vehicle sales are actually electric vehicles. So they're not even just uh, plug-in, you know, electric, uh, like hybrids anymore. The majority of new vehicle sales in Norway are actually fully battery electric vehicles. And the reason for that has been in that uh, because of tax advantages given to electric vehicles, the moment people start shopping for a car and they realize they can get into a pure electric vehicle, a modern one, for the same price as getting into an ICE or a hybrid, guess what? They choose the electric vehicle. And the reason why they do that is when the EV is being sold at the same price in the same market segment as a hybrid or ICE, the typical consumer finds the electric vehicle a superior ownership experience, right? Because it's less polluting, it's faster, it's quieter, it's more efficient, it's more comfortable to drive. And so at the same price point, you find that consumers often do not choose an ICE vehicle over an EV when they're offered at the same price point. So the key is how to get it to the same price point. And I think that's the big challenge because without subsidies and government incentives, they are more expensive than manufacture today. So we have to wait for the gap to close in terms of manufacturing costs before I think it really transitions over, perhaps help with government support. So I think in the Singapore market, there is an excellent opportunity for this to happen in the 2026, 27, 28 timeframe. The reason for that is we still see battery costs coming down year on year. We see that during those couple of years in Singapore, a lot of vehicles will be coming up with COE renewal and COE prices are expected to stabilize the decline around that period. So I think it's the combination of lower purchase price, more model availability and lower COE prices that will likely lead to our market transitioning around that period. How about your view, Heather? Yeah. So I think it's more about the government. So it's like, uh, uh, of, of course, I heard that Singapore also have the incentive that you can get the, uh, if you get the EV, you can, you can get some discount. Like same thing in US, like uh, people get the rebate and everything. In Taiwan, right now, it's like people uh, like to get the EV, but they are worried about the registration fee. Right now, the registration fee for EV is free, but they might be changing in, at the end of 2025. So I think it's the government, if they can make it, that, because it's, I think for, the, uh, for EV, getting an EV is not just uh, no maintenance, right? And it's, not, it's a smart car. Like, it's so easy to drive and also make your life easier. So really, EV is a really good chance. I mean, uh, good, good for everybody if you want to enjoy driving or that, that's, a, that's a goal to having. So if you have a seat, uh, government to uh, vote for that and people encourage that, and I think that, that a lot of people would get the EV better, yeah. For me, I think it's... Uh... Very simple reason why uh, EV have to more uh, variable to them, like uh, more effi uh, power efficiencies, uh, and EV have to like uh, affordable price. Uh, they have any way like uh, uh, they do uh, competitor each brand or the government support, and the last one is the ecosystem is ready. Uh, like a charger 
is everywhere. It's enough for everyone. And we have a more uh, mechanician to fix or to uh, support your EV. That, that is the uh, is the time is uh, everything is okay. You, you will uh, beat the ice car for sure. Uh, what water is it? <laughs> Mic drop. Yeah, just cover it all. <laughs> I mean, he's, he, but he's right. I mean, it, we, we are Singapore, right? Cost is everything. The, the value, the price is everything, you know? Um, so until the day that that's on, on par, and I'll add one more thing, until the day that the government can be a little bit more supportive in terms of um, the silly little taxes and the way they price the road tax, you know, basing road tax based on power right now seems, re seems really backward thinking. But until the day all that happens, yeah, then we'll, we'll you know, the, 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 the like EVs will catch up with ICE cars. I hear you. Now, we're all a bit biased towards Tesla because everyone here is a Tesla owner. But then we also have many friends who say, BYD is good, is cheaper than a Tesla. The Polestar is a fun car to drive. So if the friends ask, what EV should I get? What will you say? Oh, I mean, I think the answer here is unanimous. I mean... Uh, I, I've had the privilege of driving many EVs in Singapore, many brands, and hand-to-heart, objectively, Tesla's still the best car. Implementation of technology, um, infrastructure, light years ahead, light years ahead. So it's, it's very hard to argue against getting a Tesla. For me... Tesla for sure. <laughs> uh, uh, same as uh, I have to drive many EV uh, test many EV, but I think Tesla is the Tesla. Tesla, if uh, compared with the phone, I think like an iPhone. They have their own culture, their own technologies, and their own performance. And other brands uh, like to be the Tesla killer, but they cannot beat the Tesla anymore. So my answer is Tesla. Yeah, of course Tesla, we are here, right? <laughs> Tesla con Singapore. Uh, <laughs> but first thing I would say, because the charging, so infrastructure is important. And so, but it's a very big, good beginning. Like if you want to familiar with the charging system, that's the good start to start with the uh, Tesla for sure. And, uh, and also, I think Tesla just not a car. I would say it's more like an iPad with four wheels. And it's so easy to use and it's fun to use. It has camo and it has that uh, light shows. It's so, so fun to use. So I would recommend people to get Tesla first. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, so, so I'd say um, if you don't know much about EVs or you are worried about the technology, you should absolutely, I think, get a Tesla over other vehicles. And there's a reason for that. The reason is, I think today in our market, to buy an EV, which is going to be suited for all the purposes that you want, you unfortunately need to know a lot about the technology if you are buying any other brand. And I say that because what we see in the market is most brands have actually had to put in certain design or engineering compromises in their car in order to get the car to market at a certain price point. Uh, but Tesla has never done that. Because Tesla is a pure play battery electric vehicle manufacturer, they designed their cars from the ground up to be electric vehicles, and they also have never sold any car model since the Roadster, I would say, with any serious design compromises that make it difficult for you to use it as an ordinary vehicle day to day. So I'll give you a very concrete example of this, right? Think about range and think about charging power, maximum charging power, right? Tesla has never sold a single vehicle to date, although, of course, in the future, if they have more affordable vehicles, it might change, but they've never sold any vehicle to date with inadequate range or with low charging power. And that's because from the ground up, they've decided that people need to be able to use the car for anything, including maybe, for example, ride higher, taxis, maybe long distance travel. And in those design contexts, you need something which has good range and can charge very quickly when you need it too. 
But when you look at the market out there today, you will find a lot of competitors sell, especially for the entry-level electric vehicles, cars with very poor range and cars with very low charging power. And this might be fine if you just have a very specific use case in mind, like you're just going to drive it around town. And so on. in that case, the compromises are perfectly fine. You save a lot of money on that, perhaps, right? But the moment you want to use one of these cars for a long trip, for example, you want to travel from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur, right? And you buy an electric vehicle which doesn't have the right range and doesn't have enough charging power, then you are really screwed because you're going to realize the trip that you thought could be completed in three or four hours might take five, six or seven hours. And you didn't know that because you didn't know much about EVs when you bought it. If you did, maybe you would have realized, okay, I can't use the EV for this purpose. But you buy it without knowing all this, you end up with a vehicle that's not fit for the purpose that you th thought about. And I would say that that doesn't happen with a Tesla because they generally have not yet sold any vehicle with such a compromise. They've sold a vehicle so that any ICE user can get into it and just get going, doing exactly the same things they do in an ICE. Thank you. Do any of you have any question for the panelists so far? Anyone? Yes. Let me bring a mic to you. Thanks, Darren. Um, maybe this question is directed to Justin. So you said you um, drove many brands of other EV cars. Um, can you just like maybe compare to Tesla? Um, can you quote some examples why, why, why Tesla is still your preferred choice? Okay, yeah. um, I, I'm not going to mention brands here because uh, I, have, uh, I have commercial commitments. <laughs> but um, I've driven most, most of the EV brands in Singapore. And I would say um, what, what I mentioned just now in terms of technology implementation, you know, stuff like software updates, you know, stuff like autopilot. Um, and the way they implement the technology with, you know, with the screen and, and how fast and intuitive it is, nobody's even come close. I've, I've genuinely given them a fair shot to, to try. They're fine, they're just not as good. And when you talk about the, the infrastructure, the supercharger network and all that, who, who even has one? There just isn't. And I'll tell you another thing that's just so forward thinking about Tesla. Um, I don't know of another brand with a better referral program than Tesla. You're asking why I would tell my friends to buy a Tesla? Because if I ask my friends to buy a Tesla and they buy, I get benefits. Which other car brand does that? You know, so all these things they th they've thought of from buying to ownership to charging, it's, it's very, very, very difficult to think of another brand who's even, who can even come close at the moment. Question, and I think maybe for the rest of the panelists, is there anything that other EV brands do well that maybe Tesla can learn from? Can you think of anything? Buttons. Tell us more. <laughs> I mean, many, many EV cars uh, are made by ICE brands. So, as Walter mentioned just now, a lot of them build their cars with compromises, you know. They still, have a, they still have a gear lever, for example, you know. Why do you need a gear lever? I don't understand. But anyway, um, so one of the things that a lot of people cannot get used to in the Tesla is the lack of buttons. I appreciate the minimalistic look, but there are some functions that I would love to have a button for. Open the glove box, for, 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 for goodness sake, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, sure. That's a small little nitpick that you can, you can think of. Um, I would say in terms of the... I mean, they're really small things like where the charging port is located. I know of some cars, I, I want to say Audi here, I'm not entirely sure. I know of some cars who've even built charging ports on both sides of the car. Porsche. Yeah, Porsche, Porsche yeah. thank you, yeah. I thought that's, that was very intuitive. I thought that's great because not every charger is going to be in the right position for your car. So things like that, but they are small things that it would be great to have. It's not a deal breaker. All right, how about you? For me, I think um, for Thailand, I think uh, the service, after sale service of the Tesla, because uh, Tesla in Thailand, it just launched one year not fully one year, almost five years. And I think they need to improve if they, they want to sell more Tesla or gain more Tesla owner. So for now, uh, as I used to like Vitalin, they have only one service. Uh, 
equal to 8,000 owners. So I think this point, they have to improve. That other band have many, uh, like a, a service center, but Tesla, at, I think at least they have to one each uh, 3,000 is better. Thank you. Thank you. So to give a bit of context, here in Singapore, we have 2,500 Teslas, one service center. And the, the longest to come to one service center in Singapore and Topayo is about 25 minutes. It's in the middle of the country. In Thailand, they have 8,000 Teslas, one service center in Bangkok. That means if you buy a Model Y in Chiang Mai, it's going to take you a one-day trip to come to a service center. So hopefully, we'll see more. I believe Tesla Thailand will build more. Yes. Heather, what can Tesla learn from other brands? Uh, yeah, I always say about the service because uh, like in California, in a time like it's sometimes like people not easy to get the service really, uh, really easily because uh, lots of people getting uh, EV at the same time, like get the Tesla at the same time. But you, you won't be able to get the service probably like two weeks after. But it, it's improving, but not really the, not, not that easy. So I think uh, that it, and I, I also kind of feel like uh, in a service center, some of the people, they really don't know about the Tesla that, that well because maybe it's just like they're building up but it's new center, so lots of people, they, they need to uh, train the people a little more than that. But it's, it's a little difficult, but hoping that uh, will improving in the future, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think product mix is actually the biggest issue with Tesla right now. Uh, effectively, there's only one uh, there are only two real products that they have, right? Model 3 and Model Y. I mean, there's F and X, but from my point of view, I think those are really legacy products. Um, I'm not sure that they will remain in the market in the current form much longer. So they're really only in the mid-entry-level premium market for basically SUVs and, and mid-sized cars. And that doesn't meet the needs of a lot of people, right? A lot of people out there, they want things like minivans, they want compact cars, they want hatchbacks, and so on. And Tesla doesn't make them at the moment. And yes, Tesla is looking at making them. Them, but the way that Tesla runs their engineering and operations is that they tend to go for massive economies of scale. And so they're not like other automakers where they will actually design and build, for example, a smaller production run vehicle just to meet a, a certain niche. So I think one of the issues is if you're considering electric vehicles and your current family needs or your usage case doesn't quite meet the need for a mid-size sedan or a compact SUV, then you're kind of out of luck because Tesla doesn't make anything that suits your needs. So I think this is an issue that probably needs to be addressed down the road. Very good insights. Is there one more question from the audience today? Anyone raise your hands if you do. Okay, we'll see you out here. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jeff Ter. I'd like to ask the panel, in the steady state when the cars in Singapore are electric, what percentage of the electric car market do you think Tesla will capture at steady state? And if it's less than 50%, what would it take for the other car makers to catch up to occupy a significant uh, proportion of the market? Thank you. Sorry, did I hear the question right now? What will it take for Tesla to have a bigger market share? Is that what you're asking? Oh, sorry. I... Okay. Oh, what other car makers need to yeah. do to catch up to Tesla's market share? Right. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a really superficial answer. Tesla is cool. Tesla has a built-in cool factor. For many years, there was that forbidden fruit factor. Now that it's in Singapore, Tesla still has a really, really cool factor to it that's very hard to put your finger on. I, I can't tell you how to get to that level of cool, but no other car maker has that, wow, you drive a Tesla feeling. So I don't know the formula, but if they can get their car, because a lot of the car makers in Singapore are legacy car makers. You know them for years and years and years. They made those cars. So to get to that level of cool, that needs some work. So it's got to be cool. You know, a fun story I heard from my Thai friends. Before Tesla Thailand officially launched, yeah. if you drive a Model 3 or Model Y, you could park your Tesla in the supercar lot yes. in the malls. Yeah. Now that it's so common, Model 3, Model Y cannot park in supercar no, lots. You must drive 
the Model X or the Model S there. <laughs> then only you can park in supercar. Downgraded. Yeah. The, the crate is down. But uh, like Dalian said, two years ago, we like an exotic car. We can park in the supercar. And when you drive everywhere, every person will look at your cars. And when they have a chance, they will talk to you. How about the Tesla? What's in the car? How it cools? So Tesla make me that I will not go back to drive the ice car anymore. That is a, I think Tesla is a very really cool car. What do you think other car brands can do well to really catch up to Tesla? <laughs> so, but I think, yeah, the Tesla, I would say Tesla is still the, like the car, like communicate to like internationally because like in Taiwan, like people, they probably not many people uh, speak English. Like in Singapore, you can use English, right? You use English all the day. But in Taiwan, like some people speak Mandarin, but you can also change your car, uh, change your Tesla to Mandarin speaking. Like change the language, you can change the uh, language rec uh, recognition. So you can talk to Tesla in Mandarin, then they still re respond to you. So I would say uh, in this part, like Tesla is still better than the other car in, in, in this part. Uh, about other cars, <laughs> uh, I would say some of the cars, yeah, like Walter say, they having like more choice that you can have because if you are going to get a mini van like for like seven people or some, uh, yeah, that's, that's not many cars you can have. So we would, it's, uh, I, it's good to see lots of more EV coming out and uh, they are like I think EV is still a small world, like right compared to the ice car. So they are uh, learn from each other and make the EV better. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so I think for other car brands to uh, have more EV sales in Singapore, I think they're going to need to overhaul to some extent how they do the dealership. Uh, authorized dealership business or selling cars because I think one of the advantages that Tesla has had is actually in trying to change the business model of selling cars to consumers by adopting a much more direct to consumer arrangement and I think that has been especially important because in many markets uh, car dealers unfortunately face this conflict of interest which is that they are often very reluctant to sell a lot of electric vehicles because first they don't want to invest in the maintenance and training of their staff in selling electric vehicles. Second, they may also face conflicting priorities, like maybe the profit margin they make on ICE vehicles is a lot higher, and they may also face a situation where it's easier for them to sell ICE. They don't have to do this education of the consumer. So when you take all of this together, you find that traditional car dealerships often have a lot of challenges selling uh, electric vehicles because, quite frankly, their dollars and cents are not in it. They may not make as much money on it as they do in selling their ice line, so why should they bother? So this is actually a big challenge that if, the, if, if a manufacturer who wants to sell electric vehicles, they really need to work on their dealership chain. They really need to work on how they engage customers a lot more in order to make those sales. So that's why I suspect, for example, you might see uh, more success from a pure play electric vehicle manufacturer like, let's say, BYD, right? Or Polestar or something like that, compared to an existing manufacturer of a lot of ICE product lines where all of these concerns uh, come to the front. You know, like your BMWs, Mercedes-Benz, or your Toyota, right? There's a reason why they, uh, they have some mixed, uh, I think, messaging in terms of how they push electric vehicles. Thank you so much for the insights. Walter, Heather, Art, and also Justin. So uh, what's going to happen next is our panel is going to be at the back, at the cocktail area. If you want to take questions, take photos, talk to us, we're going to be behind for 15 minutes. And we've learned so much about Teslas from around the world. It also means that hopefully you've made a few new friends. So if you ever go to Taiwan or California, you've got a friend closer to home, you don't have to drive to Bangkok, even though they're driving back to Bangkok very soon, if you take a flight to Bangkok, you want to test drive a Tesla. I had the opportunity to do a Model Y road trip with some of our teammates uh, from Bangkok to Pattaya. There's superchargers. Don't need to use any third-party chargers. Arts and his team 
will be there to also give you some tips on how to have a great experience at Tesla's there. And of course, here, here in Singapore, Professor Walter, Justin, can share with you their, their tips, their experiences, their ups and downs about being a Tesla owner. So let's give them a round of applause for being here today. So thank you so much. Our next panel is going to start at 3.15. So we'll be back to Roy. The rest of us will see you all behind if you want to say hi to us or ask us any questions. Thank you so much.